Well, hello and welcome to Insight with Political Tours, the travel company led by reporters around the world. Ukraine, Gaza, not to mention numerous conflicts across Africa, some with a distinctly Russian flavor, show an increasingly insecure world. In fact, 2023 saw the highest number of armed conflicts around the globe since the Second World War. How is the rest of the world responding? And how might a Trump presidency affect it all? These were among the questions occupying a recent summit in New Delhi, and our guest today was there. She's the London-based Australian author and correspondent, Latika Bork. Hello and welcome, Latika. Pleasure to be with you. Great. And uh, where are you now? Because that's worth a little story in itself. I'm actually in Tonga, so it's 10 a.m. in the morning. I have been in Fiji and Tonga for the last week or so, and it's part of a program I've been doing over the last eight months studying disaster resilience in the Indo-Pacific, which is absolutely something I knew nothing about before I began this program. Um, and I'm now uh, relatively across things like the Sendai framework, what Japan has done as a country to lead disaster resilience around uh, its patch but also really interesting time to be in the Pacific because, of course, a geopolitical contest is underway here and you land on some of these tiny islands. The infrastructure can be good or bad depending on uh, what patch you're suddenly travelling through. And you can really see the, the material struggle that's underway between the superpowers and, of course, um, my native Australia is involved in that in trying to keep the Pacific on side. I'd love to come back uh, a little bit later, but let's focus on the, the, the main, what's well, a massive topic. Really what we're talking about is of geopolitical stability, security, global stability. And as I said in, in the introduction, the world really is going through a very difficult time. What was the purpose and the focus of this summit, of this conference, if you like, that you attended in New Delhi? Yes, so this is called the Rizina Dialogue, and it's set up a very, uh, in a very close partnership with the Indian government. It's run through an independent think tank, uh, the Observer Research Foundation, and it, over the last decade, has built this forum into, I guess, the kind of premier ge geopolitical conference for India to talk about its strategic priorities. What was so fascinating about this dialogue was it took place in New Delhi a week after the Munich Security uh, Forum in Munich, in Germany. Now, I didn't go to Munich this year. I went to Munich last year. And everyone who I know who went to Munich this year, and, of course, I kept a close eye on it from afar, was saying that everyone was just walking around depressed in a bit of a death row, almost talking themselves into a bit of a crisis because, of course, Europe is so gripped by the idea that Donald Trump might be back in the White House this time next year if I'm talking to you and your guests, Nicholas. And, of course, that could be existential for Ukraine. It could have huge repercussions for Europe. We know the Trump administration targeted Europe uh, through steel sanctions, for example, in its first term. And then possibly NATO itself. Now, Trump has had a long history of not liking NATO. He is one of many US presidents who's asked Europe to do a bit more in spending. Finally, they get the message. But the problem for Europe and NATO is whether they have been uh, too belated in catching up to this message. So that's the context for Rosina Dialogue, which we hit in New Delhi a week later. You couldn't have had a more different mood. Firstly, it's a, it's must be said that India is absolutely booming. It's been five years since I was last in India. The development is just next level. I have not seen a country transform in such a rapid pace as what is happening under India. And it explains a lot about why there's a lot of concerns about Narendra Modi's government and his perceived democratic backsliding, but why ordinary Indians don't really care about this. So what does that mean for India's foreign policy? Well, we have a very confident India. India is coming alive. It is finding its position on the world stage. It has always been a reluctant player. It has not wanted to get into ge geopolitical contests. Of course, it borders China and its rival, and it is very unfriendly with China. That hasn't always necessarily translated 
into India wanting to lead any sort of conversation on China or any sort of pushback on China. It's always preferred to go its own way. At the Rosina Dialogue, what I was most struck by was that it was not other Asian countries who were hugely present. It was actually Europe and in particular Eastern European leaders. And they were there with a very clear message. Um, the, the premier speaker or the flagship speaker was the Greek prime minister, Kyrgios Mitsotakis, who got up and gave a very beautiful, eloquent speech about the birthrights of democracy and how India and Greece are these two democratic uh, partners, I suppose, in different parts of the world, but can look towards each other. But Narendra Modi attended this speech. Now, dissent in India is not huge, and it's something that is extremely discouraged by the Modi government, particularly when it comes to India's position on things like the war in Ukraine. Mr. Tarkas got up and said, actually, if you want to be a great power, we all have responsibilities and nobody can afford to sit on the sidelines when it comes to conflicts like Ukraine. So the background there is that India is very neutral on the war in Russia. It is obviously for decades since post-Cold War has been, uh, sorry, during the Cold War, has been a military partner of Russia. So it is now taking this position uh, really against its quad partner, you could say the United States, for example, against Europe opposition on this, that it wants to stay out of the war in Ukraine. Not just stay out, though, it's hugely profiting. It is buying enormous sums of Russian oil. It processes it and then sells it to countries like Australia, the US and the UK, which have sanctioned Russian oil. So there is a bit of hypocrisy there as well. But what I overall found, Nicholas, at the Rosina Dialogue was a hugely optimistic, energetic nation in India that does not share the concerns that are pervading particularly the Western media, which really still does run the global conversation, and in particular Europe. Uh, it does not share the same negativity about what happens if Trump comes back and Ukraine falls. We're already, of course, seeing Europe's own support for Ukraine under question. It also doesn't care about a reborn Trump administration. Jashanka, the, the country's foreign minister, was asked directly about this because, of course, anyone you ask in Europe hyperventilates. Um, and Carl Bildt was a good example. He's the former Swedish PM. He was on a forum. And he was asked, are you worried about stress? Yes and yes. Uh, if he was worried about Trump, yes and yes, I'm very stressed, he says. You asked Jai Shankar, well, no. India got a very good deal under Trump. India fared very well in the world under a Trump administration. We're not so bothered. And so you really see India's foreign policy taking shape here. Obviously, it's extremely self-interested. Obviously, it's extremely transactional. Can that be any – is that any different mm. from – the United States or the UK, I think most people would say probably not. Now, you did a great interview with the Czech Foreign Minister, Jan Lepavsky, and uh, in that interview, he, he said this, he said, my concern is Russian imperialism. I'm very clear about that in different ways. I'm speaking about this because it's the, the cause of Putin's attack on Ukraine. It's the root cause of Ukraine's war, war refugees in Czechia. It's the root cause for higher energy prices in Europe. It's the root cause for coup d'etats in Africa and hunger. It's quite easy in that sense. But you're basically saying is that's all falling on deaf ears. I think so, yes. There was an absolute string of European leaders and foreign ministers, defence ministers coming through Rizina, all with this same message. Mitsotakis made it very publicly to Narendra Modi. Uh, all of the foreign ministers that we spoke to on and off the record were raising this in private with the Indian government. Now, I'm not sure that's so productive. I think it is good for Europe to show up. I think it's good for Europe to consistently make its case in India. But I do worry that the more they seem to or seem to be seen to be pushing or trying to badger in the, in India into a position that is more sympathetic towards its own, it could backfire. And you do, have a, yeah. you do have a very confident and I would almost say verging on cocky foreign minister in Jai Shankar. India is in no mood to be lectured by right now by the whole world. They point to 2020 and say, well, when we had a skirmish with China who actually took some 
uh, part of our land on the line of no control. Um, where was the world then? Where were you all caring about sovereignty and territorial mm. integrity? Well, we looked around and found no friends. So they've got a point. They really do. On the other hand, I do think India is playing a risky game here because if Ukraine does fall, it has a weakened Europe. It could have, and, and if that is the consequence of a Trump administration, that's a very weak, infighting America that you have. And I'm not massively sure that in that environment, China is a dormant kind of aggressor sitting on its border, just biding its time. That, if we look at all what the analysts say, could embolden China to then behave and act more aggressively. And India will no doubt be caught up in that just as Taiwan would. So I do actually think it's a bit of a mistake for India yeah. not to be as open to Europe's complaints about this because Ukraine, you do really have a very clear case of territorial um, integrity being compromised and it is going to be existential for Europe, whether the rest of the world likes it or not, if Ukraine does fall this year. Did you get a sense, I know there are lots of, um, you know, um, commanders of uh, general staff, a lot of big military figures, both from France, the UK and the US. Um, did, did you get a sense of what their response was to a looming crisis in the Pacific uh, if, if there was conflict with China? And I think there's, I'm right in saying there's certainly a, a growing fear of that conflict coming and how the region, how the Pacific should deal with it. Was there a, did you get a sense of that there? Yes, this is one of the more, I think, troubled aspects of where foreign policy is going for Europe. Europe is suddenly in this desperate tilt or effort to make itself be seen, to make itself be visible in the Indo-Pacific. We've had Macron here in the Pacific over the last six or eight months, I think it was. Uh, we have no shortage of European leaders, whether they be military or government figures, heading to dialogues like this to say, hey, we're showing up. So Ben Key, for example, the first sea lord of the UK, was also here, um, was also in New Delhi along with the French. And they were all trying to make the same point. We're here in the Pacific, we're here to stay, and we consider this part of the region as important to our security and the global order and underlining the importance of the international rules uh, that govern our safety and prosperity. The trouble is a lot of these countries do not have the resources to back up what they're saying. And Britain is a really clear example of this. It wants to send a warship every kind of three, four years. Now, that's great. Um, AUKUS is obviously going to be a great program if it gets up. I think there's a lot of concerns about whether we will that's actually... the submarine do... program backed by the exactly. US and the UK along with Australia. Exactly. And I think there's a big question. There's like We can talk about that a bit later, but there's a big question about whether AUKUS in delivering nuclear uh, propelled submarines to Australia will ever actually come off. So we have the UK wanting to be in the region. We have France wanting to be in the region. But to be honest, I'm not sure that it's taken as seriously as, say, when the US says, well, we're going to pivot to Asia or we're now going to make the Indo-Pacific our priority, which is something that the Republicans certainly say. And I do think people take them seriously when that is said. So it, I want to t come to another interview you did because you did a, a lot of um, great ones there. And this is with Tony Abbott, the former Australian Prime Minister. And I mean, this is we're pivoting slightly um, away from China, but it's, it's dealing with that capacity um, to d deal with existential threats, the threat from China, in this case, the threat from Russia. Tony Abbott had a particular message, and it's, it's not a new one for him, but you, you, he certainly repeated it in an interview with you. What was he saying? Well, Tony Abbott's a very interesting figure. He's an extremely controversial political figure in Australia. He's considered to be very conservative and right-wing, and by conservative, I mean culturally conservative. In Australia, the right-wing party is called the Liberals. Um, so that gives you a kind of sign of how, uh, I guess, um, mainstream the Liberal Party is meant to be in governing for all of Australia. Tony Abbott is certainly to the right of that. Now, he left, he was in power actually when MH17 was downed. So Russia for him has always been a particular agenda Australia was very scarred when MH17 went down. There were 38 Australian citizens and residents, including children on that flight, beautiful little family in Perth. 
And the country was really horrified. And it was one of the few examples of where what happens in eastern Ukraine, which is a country Australians did not pay a lot of attention to before, uh, I would say, the full-scale invasion, and only in this instance when MH17 went down, can have direct consequences in the safety and indeed the lives of ordinary Australians just trying to get home. So Tony Abbott um, very famously during this time threatened to shirt front Vladimir Putin. Nicholas, do you watch Australian football at all? I'm afraid I know you have to explain what short front, shirt front means. Okay, well, I don't watch this particular code of football either. So I had to be informed what shirt fronting meant. Now, it's a very aggressive um, AFL move on the pitch. So essentially, uh, Tony Abbott is saying, I want to take the beef to Vladimir Putin. Um, a very colourful way of saying I've got a beef with this guy and I want to take it up with him. But this was, I guess, a kind of indication of the value sense that drives Tony Abbott on this issue and how viscerally he personally felt about Russian revanches, uh, re um, Russia's uh, agenda. So when Ukraine has happened, Tony Abbott has come out and been one of the staunchest and clearest advocates of Ukraine. And Australia's own support for Ukraine has waned since the change of government to a Labor government. And Tony Abbott's been very unhappy about that. For instance, Australia still has not even reopened its embassy in Kyiv. What also troubles Tony Abbott is the behaviour of the US Republicans. I mean, these are his political brethren. And a lot of his own mates in his Liberal Party in Australia are very close to some of these MAGA Republicans in the United States. And here he diverges very strongly from where I guess you could say that strand of conservative right-wing politics is heading. And so I bumped into him at Rizina and we we're having a little chat and I said, look, what, what is happening, you know, in the US? And he says to me, look, isolationism is just rampant. So he agrees to give me an on-the-record interview. And I really did try and press him as to why he thinks the Republican Party has gone so far to the point where you see uh, right-wing figures like Tucker Carlson holding, I mm -hmm. guess, to our, uh, you know, love-ins with Putin in the idea that this will be beamed back to MAGA supporters and they will therefore continue with their program of saying we should withdraw support for Ukraine. Abbott, classic Abbott, gives me this terrific line where he says, well, you know, one of the baffling things about Trump is kind of sends everyone a bit crazy. On the left for years, we've had this thing called Trump derangement syndrome. But then he says on the right, it seems in some quarters of the GOP, we're experiencing a Putin fascination syndrome. And then he went on to explain that he thinks that some in the GOP think that Putin's one of them because Putin is so clearly anti-woke on things like LGBTQIA uh, rights, because Putin is uh, posing as an Orthodox Christian and the family unit is, is a value, something that resonates, of course, with evangelical Christians in America. And Tony Abbott is very clear. He says, well, look, no conservative goes around murdering, murdering their opponents, no conservative uh, invades their neighbour, and no conservative who is true conservative behaves the way Putin's been doing for 20 years. Now, I thought that was a pretty interesting comment from somebody in the right because it follows an encounter that Abbott had last year when he was in the United States attending the Wall Street Journal CEO Council and the House Speaker, Mike Johnson, who, of course, is holding up the vote in the House on, giving, uh, on, on voting on new aid for Ukraine. Uh, Abbott said to him, look, please don't let the House go home for Christmas before giving Ukraine what they need. So, i.e., please just call on the vote. And clearly Mike Johnson did not heed what Abbott had to say. But I think what you're seeing there is this enormous fracturing that is taking, taking place in, in the right around the world. And I think that is a trend to watch because, yes, MAGA Republicans seem on top right now. And if Trump does come back in, Nicholas, it's automatic that his gr grip on the Republican, Republican Party is fairly permanent for the foreseeable future. That is not a view that is shared by right-wing parties necessarily around the world. And I think it is incumbent upon the right wing, like Tony Abbott has been doing, almost a bit like Boris Johnson has been trying to do as well, David Cameron to, I think, lesser effect because he comes from the moderate side of the Conservatives in the UK, has also been making similar pleas.
Now, it could all fall on deaf ears, uh, just like the prior conversation we were having. But I do think it's a, a very noble thing that they're running around doing. And you can only contrast that with, for example, the behaviour of Liz Truss, uh, who went over to the United States to promote herself rather than a cause. Um, and did did Tony Abbott give you, we, we've just come back from the States, we were in Iowa during the caucuses, I won't say just, we, it was. It, this was in freezing January, um, but I, I was struck really by two things. One was um, how huge numbers of ordinary Americans don't have an issue with voting Trump. And when I say they're not the sort of MAGA brigade, they're just, you know, the mid-level bank manager or there's somebody who's got a farm and they, they don't see it. They think that, that they, they he's got some kind of appeal, but he's a conservative like them. And he said some lousy things, but we're going to vote for him. He's better than Biden. Biden's the bigger threat to democracy. So I sort of get where that's that's coming from. But what I can't when what I, I said to um, you know a couple in a bar in Denison, Iowa, was you know we're we're worried about Ukraine. We're really worried about Russia. This matters to us, and it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to them at all. It doesn't come into their lives. It's just too far away. And I get that. It's not relevant. But did Tony Abbott give you an explanation as to why um, the the leadership of the Republican Party stick with this? Um, did do, do you did you get any sense of that? I'm mean, I'm maybe asking a question you can't answer. I think. I think to just take on your own observation there, Nicholas, is this question about Ukraine and what the US priorities are. Now, if you look at some of the messaging from the Republicans, uh, Trump, but also a lot of the people around his circle who, who advocate this idea that the United States should withdraw from Ukraine, one of the arguments given is that this would give us time and resources and bandwidth to focus on China, which is our real struggle. And that's the United States under direct threat from a superpower that wants to supersede it and upend the global order. Now, I did ask Tony Abbott about this. Well, what if, um, is, this, is this a believable, compelling argument that actually if they can shore up what's happening in the Indo-Pacific, which is, uh, you know, the old saying goes, Russia is the thunderstorm, China is the climate change. If, if that is freeing up the United States to deal with that, is that somewhat a desirable outcome or at least an understandable one. Abbott was actually very interesting on this because I wasn't sure what he would say, but he said, I actually don't believe this. These same people who are saying, let's withdraw from Ukraine, he says it's the same sentiment that will see them abandon Taiwan should it come push to shove. Now, I I personally probably am, am more open-minded to that view than, than the other view that is being put forward by Republicans, but we'll have to wait and see. The Trump administration, if it comes back, I think would be just as unpredictable and difficult to read and forecast as the first iteration. We do know that he cares about China, but we saw also very muddled policy responses from him in relation to China. The big tragedy I think, is that most right-wingers would feel more comfortable for voting for Biden than many left-wingers in America would at the moment because the Biden administration is actually picking up uh, a lot of the issues that Trump successfully put on the table and, and exposed this enormous fault line, exposed what had gone wrong with globalisation and where that had led middle America in hollowing out manufacturing hollowing out the regions, hollowing out cultural identity, all these things that policymakers are now furiously trying to sort out, um, perhaps a little too late. And I think things like the CHIPS Act, things like the IRA, I think deep down you would find uh, figures like Tony Abbott, and he didn't say this to me, this is certainly my own interpretation and analysis, I think you would find that figures like he would actually be a lot more comfortable in voting for a Biden administration than uh, a reborn GOP under Trump at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's the same um, across. I mean, I would say more traditional Republicans. That's certainly true. That's the. Uh, I recognise those comments and conversations we've had with numerous people um, across the states, and not just on on the you know on the periphery on the east and west coast. I mean, in in, in the, the Midwest too. Um, I I'm going to. I'd love to get some questions from people. So um, please do everyone put your questions in the Q and A box so that you can. Um, put your questions directly to Latika. Um, one thing I'm going to mention is Latika's got a great um, Substack uh, site where she posts a lot of her articles. She also posts what she's reading um, each <laughs> week. 
Uh, and there's some, and I'm going to come on and I want to pick up on some of those articles in a second. So, and I think we'll share um, the Substack and the chat to the side so people can see that. So we'll come to that in, in just a second. I, I want to talk a bit about, because um, you're there, um, you've got expertise in the UK and also Australia. So I want to pivot a bit and, and move a bit away from the um, global um, security or insecurity disorder uh, and talk a bit about UK politics. Um, you have, well, here we are, we've got a general election in the offing. There's talk about, you know, could even happen in May. Um, it's probably most certainly gonna happen by the autumn, if not in the autumn. Um, you wrote an interesting article quite recently in January, I think it was, about what the UK Conservative Party could learn from the Liberals in Australia. Just first of all, tell us what happened to the Liberals in Australia and how that's a parallel for the Conservatives here. Yeah, there's two really interesting parallels that have happened between Australian politics and UK politics. And of course, a lot of the same figures operate between the two jurisdictions including myself, I suppose you could say, Nicholas. So it's a, it's a good way to observe what's happening. Um, I'll say from the outset, though, I'm very cautious, and I do think it's a bit of a mistake in the UK to reach for these Australian solutions, which I see a lot of, both in political campaigning, both in the policy sense, and also just in the media, you know, this idea that things that work in Australia or were successful might and could be transplanted just as easily onto the UK. I think that's a mistake for uh, some very clear reasons, which I'm happy to explain a little later. But let's go to the Liberal Party. So the Liberal Party, the centre-right party, was booted out of government in 2022, I think. I'm losing track of the years, Nicholas. Mm. May 2022. It was a very unpopular leader, Scott Morrison, leading a very old, by our, by our modern standards now, um, three-term government in, in the centre-right. And people really, really disliked the leader. At the time, he had led them through COVID. They felt poorly. And he was not a very popular prime minister. So it should have been an absolute romping for the Labor Party. It was only a few seats that they needed to win. But actually what transpired on the night was the lowest ever primary vote for the Labor Party. They did win, but just... I think uh, it was by one seat in the immediate kind mm. of count. So counts in Australia take a long time now because we have preferential voting and it's compulsory voting. And because of the narrowness of the votes, outcomes can take weeks to decide. In the old days when I was growing up, you'd, you'd know on the night. Now, of course, there's a lot more contestability. And so Labor scrapes on in into government. The Prime Minister is Anthony Albanese. He's a very, very poor campaigner. He made little to no effort in that campaign. And more worryingly, he made no attempt to really put a very daring or Labor policy agenda on the table for what he wanted to do. He was very, very happy to campaign as being, I'm just not that guy. Does that sound a bit familiar, yeah, Nicholas? That sounds familiar, yeah. That sounds um, cautiously familiar. Exactly. Now, what happened was everyone thought the Liberals, which were decimated, they lost a truckload of seats, including in the metropolitan heartland. So these were seats that the former prime ministers has, had held, held by wet or progressive centre-right figures. And these seats went to third-party candidates, either Greens or a new rise in independent teals, most of them women, because we have a very big gender problem in Australian politics. And a lot of the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison's issues was that he was seen to be a very blokey, unappealing option for a lot of women who felt very, very frustrated uh, for about a good decade or so about the way women were being treated in politics and, and in the national debate. So Morrison really took the brunt of that anti-women backlash and they subsequently voted in teals to replace a lot of Liberals. So the Liberals were really decimated. Lib the Labor Party gets into government but just, but then takes that victory as though it's won 10 or 20 seats. So everyone looked at the Liberal Party and thought, right, you're left now with your hard right conservative wing. Basically a lot of the, the brethren that Tony Abbott, that former Prime Minister I was telling you about before, he would have felt very comfortable at home with this particular caucus that's remaining. And everyone thought they would go really hard right, they would lean into culture wars like trans issues and things. 
didn't happen. They did elect a very conservative and I think potentially unelectable leader in this guy called Peter Dutton. He's been around for a long, long time in politics. He's also very divisive in Australia. But what he has actually done is stabilise the Liberals. He has placed a premium on internal unity. And what has happened is remarkably the coalition has started polling neck and neck with Labor. That should be unheard of. I mean, Labor should be in its first term uh, in in its glory days. It had Mm. an extraordinarily long honeymoon. But what happened, Nicholas, and this is contained in a second piece I wrote, which I know you will have read, is that by about 18 months in, they kind of ran out of having anything to do because it turns out if you run for government by just not being the other guy, i.e. just not being Rishi Sunak, you get midway through your term and you've not got a lot to do. The honeymoon's over. People no longer give you credit for not being that other guy. They're now looking at you and saying, what are you doing to fix my cost of living? What are you doing to bring interest rates down? What are you doing to protect me from the external threats we face? And unfortunately for Labor, they have found themselves not in a great position being able to deal with this. They put up a referendum on an Indigenous voice to parliament that absolutely uh, tanked and everybody could see that a mile off, or I certainly could, um, that it was going to fail again. The Prime Minister did not campaign very well. He put little to no effort in. And so he's facing election. It could be as early as the end of this year or it could be next year. And I think the expectation is that he probably would get back in, but he could be facing a minority government situation. Okay. That's certainly not the position he should have been in. Okay, so this is, I mean, uh, we're, we're, I don't want to, we've got a global audience, we've got people in the States, we've got people in Australia, we've got people in the UK, and I, in a way, I don't want to get bogged down too much in UK politics because it might switch people off. But I think that that is, the point is that you've got a very right-wing government here, and it is really pushing issues that are divisive, culture wars, you know, they, they're talking about immigration, which I don't think are actually having an, an impact. I mean, there's a lot of talk about it, but it's not getting them any um, increase in the polling. And I can't, the, the main candidates to lead this party after it presumably weeds, leads, loses the election are a very, even more divisive figures. I mean, we're thinking uh, yeah. of um, Suella Braverman, for example, the former um, Home Secretary for a while, um, who said it was her dream to get people uh, on planes to Rwanda. We're talking about deporting migrants who arrive on our shores rather than processing them here. I can't see that changing. And I just see, I mean, you, 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 uh, I, your predictions seem to be different to me. No, what I'm saying is the lesson is there for the Conservatives should they choose to take it. Will they take it? I think that's another question. It doesn't have to depend on the political stripe or leaning of the leader. Um, A very right-wing leader can still unify the party and focus on mainstream issues. And that, I think, is the salient point about what the Australian Liberals have done, i.e. they have not run to the hard right on culture wars. They have tried to keep the debate on the centre on things like, yes, border control and migration, which are big issues in Australia, but mainly cost of living, inflation. Um, Anthony Albanese, you said that you would bring people's bills down while you haven't, it's two years on. These are very cut through kind of messages. And the point of what the Australians are doing is that, hey, Tories, should you find yourselves out of government by the end of the year, here is a path for viability sooner rather than later. What was and should have been a fairly existential, potentially even extinction event for the right in Australia, has not transpired that way, partly because of the way they responded to the threat of near extinction. And that's the lesson for the Tories. Nicholas, you can only lead donkeys to water. Whether they drink is another question. Yeah, yeah, okay, (laughs) okay, okay. Um, And I've I've mentioned that because you've written about it, and so I I was drawing people's attention to your... um, your Substack articles. Um, so I want to come back to the the, the big, bigger issues now, and and coming back when you're talking about the Munich uh, conference and the and the sense of um, how people were depressed there. Um, is Europe ready for you for Trump? Uh, it, how is 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 Europe capable of handling Ukraine? Um, one of the articles you picked up on was a, a reading of of um, on Macron, 
and how he mm. seems to be far more proactive. What's your take mm. on that? I mean, he, Macron's mentioned the, the idea of even sending troops, French troops into mm -hmm. Ukraine. I should add, I think it's a, a badly kept secret that we, we actually, and this came out in the German leaks um, that the, the Russians put out, that we've got um, troops there operating in Ukraine. I think that's some, um, I think it's reasonably well known among people who cover it. That's right, yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so two things. I think there's been a lot of focus in the UK particularly about the cost of Brexit to the UK. What has not been so widely covered or considered is the cost of Brexit to Europe. And I think we are now seeing the costs of Brexit to Europe because it used to be that Germany, France and Britain would provide a very powerful troika. And on things like this, that direction would be shaped by the three of them battering out their positions in private and then really trying to move Europe towards a position as one. Obviously, NATO drives the military response, but the European political response was always kind of sorted out in that way. And from my sources in Brussels, they have told me no, no country has really stepped up into that vacuum or that position left vacant by the British. What you're now seeing is a complete breakdown between the French and Germans, which is just awful to see at a time like this but it does show a very, very divergent path between these two powers. Germany does not want to escalate its own role. Um, having said that, we should be fair to Germany. They have contributed more in funding and military aid and promised more than the French have, and the French are very sensitive on that point. But we're coming to a different point in this war. Last year was defined by stalemate. 2024 could be defined by breakthrough and not for the Ukrainians. We're looking, if you look at all the threat assessments that were released, Norway put theirs out last week, the US put their threat assessment out last week. They paint a very grim picture. Russia is recalibrating. It has got its defence industry up at pace much faster than the West has. And this could be the year it makes gains on Ukraine. So I think this positioning by Macron has in many ways come out of the blue and come as a surprise because it goes against Macron's own positioning at the start of the war, where he was actually seen and portrayed, uh, portrayed, whether unfairly or not, as almost a bit of an appeaser to Putin, trying to hold meetings with Putin, get him still negotiating when it was very clear that Putin had made up his mind to invade. And so you're now seeing a troika emerge today, I think, uh, Tusk and uh, Poland, um, and Germany and France have held a meeting and there's some talk about whether Poland, which is actually carrying out the real Zeitenbender in Europe, it has increased its own defence spending by 4%, much more than most of the NATO allies, whether it could fill that position left by the UK. I'm not so sure. I think it's a great tragedy um, that Britain is not able to find a way to lead this similar security conversation uh, I know Labor, if it's elected, wants to have a, a greater security partnership. I'm not sure the climate's there. There's a, a lot of PTSD in Brussels about Britain and any kind of suggestion of, uh, let's yeah. get a bit back closer, let's get yeah. back into bed on a couple of things. Everyone I talk to says, guys, just leave us alone. Please keep yeah. your drama in your own house for a while. Um, but I think that is the dynamic that underpins everything of what Macron is doing here. He's searching... He looked around and went, who's the leader of Europe? It's nobody. Why isn't it me? The problem Macron has is that he's domestically unpopular at the moment. Um, he is also under attack from the far right in his own country. And Macron is also inconsistent. Mm. He has said a lot of things over the years, and he's a very creative thinker, but he's not always the best assessor strategically. I mean, it was he who made the infamous comment now that NATO was experiencing brain death. Well, hello, look forward to where we are now. And NATO is expanded by two countries. You have 18 of 31 allies actually finally hitting their defence spending targets of 2% of GDP compared to a decade ago when that was just 3%. So things like that really do haunt Macron's ability to fashion himself as the leader of Europe. And, of course, Nicholas, there's always, I think, a little resentment about French vanity when you, when you were speaking about the French and, and whether yeah. they're the true leaders of Europe. Uh, there's there's debate about a new Secretary General for NATO. Does that matter in the, in the big scheme of things? Does that really matter in terms of um, these key questions? Yeah, it does. 
And I think that's also playing into this because Eastern Europe doesn't want a complete coronation of Mark Rutte, who is perceived to be uh, the shoe-in for this role. He's been endorsed by the United States, the UK, and, uh, and most of the, the big Western European partners. So notionally, that should be game over. But the Europeans, uh, Eastern Europeans are going to put up Latvia, a Latvian candidate. And there are a lot of uh, important voices swinging in behind that. Some of those voices are the same ones now supporting Macron. And here I'm talking about Lithuania, Estonia, also, even Finland has now changed its position and come out uh, just in the last 24 hours, supporting the idea of Macron opening this conversation about potential troops in Ukraine. And I think it's important to stress there that there are some dimensions of this debate that Macron is trying to trigger. Um, whether it's it's completely supportive of troops or European troops or French troops or NATO troops in Ukraine, that's a, a bit different. Actually, what we're seeing now is a lot of leaders saying, yeah, I think it's okay to put on the table that at some point in time we might need a carefully targeted um, mission to Ukraine to support Ukraine, and that's not something we should rule out because at the moment Putin will take anything else as a green light to mm. keep going and do whatever he wants to break Ukraine. So I think for the first time we're seeing Macron, he may actually may uh, land this pitch he's making. Yeah. So I mean, in a way, also there's the contrast in Russia's um, says that he can do what the hell it wants, and Euro Europe's incapable of doing anything. And it's a riposte to um, Russia's aggression, trying to sort of whip up a bit of confidence at the same time. Uh, let, let's take some questions. We've got Alan Livingston, who's in Texas. Um, Alan, just open your microphone and put your question, which I think is more about Australia. Go ahead, Alan. Yes, thank you, Nicholas. I'm very much enjoying the conversation here. Uh, my question is, um, is there much continual controversy in Australia uh, with its trade with China, especially in strategic minerals? I've also known that the environmental lobby uh, at one time was very strong about the shipping of Australian coal, and I wondered how that's changed. I, I didn't put the question uh, uh, on my uh, uh, written question, but I'd also like to know if there's any comments there on what's going on in the Middle East and in Gaza, what uh, the Australian position might be in other countries in the Middle East. Alan, yeah. that was a great question. Thank you so much. Um, yes, really good points. The trade one is absolutely fascinating. So you might remember that during the pandemic, Australia was subjected to huge economic tariffs by China. The former government under Scott Morrison requested an inquiry into COVID-19, the origins of that virus. China did not like this and they imposed almost overnight out of the blue 80% tariffs on barley, 212% tariffs on Australian wine and many other goods like lobster and coal. Now, the Labor government came into power saying, we're going to stabilise that trading relationship with China and we're going to try and get these tariffs lifted. Under the former government, we had started WTO disputation against China. China came to the Australian government after the change and said, look, um, would you mind uh, ahead of this review coming down, which, is probably, which was widely reported was going to be unfavourable to China, would you mind if you pause this, gave us a few weeks to reconsider and we'll come back and uh, look, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, we might have lifted the tariffs. That actually happened on Bali last year. The Australian government's very confident that that's about to happen on red wine this year. And what we saw very fascinatingly last week was the Australian government coming out and saying, well, this vindicates our preferred approach of dialogue over disputation. So that's a real divergence now that we're seeing in Australia on the China relationship. It is widely perceived that the Labor government has taken a much softer line with China. Uh, under the former government, China and Australia did not speak. Relations became so bad that China wouldn't pick up official phone calls, so it wouldn't take communications from the former prime minister. Um, fast forward a couple of years, under Labor, the Anthony Albanese, the prime minister, was rewarded with a very big state visit to Beijing just a couple of months ago, uh, actually after he went to the United States. So in terms of the society, there is still a lot of anxiety about China in the Australian community. And in terms of economic dependency, 
everybody knows that it's not an ideal situation. Australia is still by far dependent on China for its two-way trade. In fact, the terms of trade with China have gone up since the pandemic. So while the Australian government and while many business and industry bodies have made a big show of saying we need to diversify, in actual of fact, the opposite has happened. We've actually increased our trade with China. The next big boom Australia is about to experience, having had a coal boom, having had an iron ore boom and a gas boom, is a critical minerals boom. I was looking at the statistics just a couple of weeks ago. Most of that lithium, including one month, 97% of that lithium was exported to one country. You guessed it, China. Now, it then reprocesses uh, that lithium, turns it into batteries, and guess what the top six models, where the top six models of EVs that are currently sold in Australia come from? You guessed it, China. So I don't think Australia has learnt the lessons, and I don't think that debate is honest enough in Australia. Deep down, everybody knows that that dependency is not desirable, but it's very, very difficult to break that di- di- uh, that that dependence. For example, Australia just tried to negotiate an agreement with the EU, and that failed after five years of negotiations, all over about ten thousand tons of beef. So it's becoming very difficult to look around and see other trading partners in this sort of environment. Um, And it's very easy, I think, for many Australian businesses to just go back to what they know. On the Middle East, this has been a huge issue for the Labor government, and it's exposed them to a lot of attack from those Greens and Teals, for example, who were very big uh, forces in, in the last election at both Labor and the Liberal Party's expense. Now, Australia joined in suspending the funding to UNRWA um, and has just, as of yesterday, reinstated that a bit later than the EU, Sweden and Canada did, but nevertheless has come back on board and reinstated that. It is under huge pressure from pro-Palestinian pressure groups in Australia. Um, they, the government is run by two notional uh, left faction. So even inside the Labor Party, they're, they're more left wing than most of their um, colleagues. That's Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister, and Penny Wong, the Foreign Minister. So this has been an extremely difficult line for them to walk in terms of talking to their own support base, but also going out to the wider community. And of course, keeping Australia's foreign policy in line with that of its allies. Now, we have provided support support, by the way, of a couple of people in Bahrain uh, to the mission in the Red Sea, um, in, to, to, sorry, to the mission in the Middle East to stop the, try and stop the Houthis from targeting commercial shipping. But we have not sent a warship. And one of the reasons that the government gave for that was to say, well, we need to look after our own patch in the Indo-Pacific. We don't have the resources to send across to the Middle East, and that's a a faraway conflict. You also see that same messaging from the government when it comes to Ukraine. Ukraine just asked Australia for a second shipment of humanitarian coal because, as we know, Putin has been targeting energy infrastructure and Ukraine experiences sub-zero temperatures in winter. Australia has denied sending Ukraine a second shipment of coal. One of the reasons Anthony Albanese gave uh, was that uh, Ukraine is far away and that if it wants coal, it can buy coal from suppliers closer to it. And he said that Australia's most recent donation of military aid, by the way, of 50 million AUDs, it's about 27,000 uh, million um, pounds, Great British. Uh, he said, well, Ukraine can use that money to decide whether it wants to buy weapons or coal. And if it wants the coal, it can buy them from customers closer to it. It's not a great position for Australia to be having. And there is still a lot of support in the Australian community for supporting Ukraine more than what is currently taking place. So there's some snapshots on how all of those crises are Mm. fitting into government thinking and policy. I I want to, um, um, I'd love more questions of the way we will be wrapping up really within the next five minutes or so. So if people do have um, questions, please do put your question in the Q&A box so you can get the last quick question into Latika before we finish. Latika, what can you see what we've we've mentioned Gaza briefly? I mean, the, the impact of this is huge within the US election. We're going to go to um, Michigan 
Um, no, we're getting, we're getting Michigan. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're getting to Michigan. And that is clearly very affected by this crisis. Big Arab American population. We can see Biden pivoting now on his um, Israel on support for Israel. The leader of the Democrats in the Senate coming up. Very strong speech against Netanyahu, basically saying that he should for, um, to come down. Where, where else? What are the other ramifications? Where else can you see Gaza having an impact? I mean, it, this is a big subject, I know. I think one of the big uncharted or unrecognised effects that the war in the Middle East has had is on the war in Ukraine. Mm. Until we had the war in the Middle East begin, the war in Ukraine was largely, I think, sorted in the general public's mind about right, wrong, invasion is not okay. What we have seen with the conflict in the Middle East is muddy the discussion on war and conflict. And perhaps all those people who were a bit uncomfortable with the way that war had been discussed in the media and almost, I would say, embraced a little. Um, the peaceniks who might have found a, a more, um, you know, accommodating media environment during the Iraq war, for example, or in during Afghanistan. They were largely silenced during Ukraine. Now we see those people coming to the fore and that, I think, has had flow and effect for the conflict in Ukraine. I think there is huge conflict fatigue setting in amongst the public. But this is so dangerous because reading through the US threat assessment, for example, which was released this week, the overwhelming and overriding message from that document and, and indeed from the Norwegians as well, and there's been multiple other jurisdictions put out their threat assessments, is that actually conflict's here to stay. If we had a hope when these conflicts began, say October 7 last year, say February 2022, that they might be wrapped up in a year or two or that Israel might somehow achieve this fuzzy goal of eliminating Hamas in the Gaza Strip, we might have thought that would have been concluded by now. And I think you see in the frustration in the United States that they had clearly hoped this military operation would have been concluded by now. That, I think, is going to set in uh, this, this conflict with ongoing fatigue at a time when those conflicts are actually at risk of not just enduring but spilling over, widening and escalating. Yeah, uh, depressing stuff. Well, listen, I think we're going we're gonna to leave it there, Letika, without more we're, questions. We're going to end from... on that depressing note. Yes. Out, <laughs> no, I've got one. I can see one hand going up. I can see one hand going up. So I will take what we do. It's within our uh, allotted time. So I've got a question from Lois Tawart, who I think is in Sydney. So go ahead, Lois. Hello, Latika. Um, I'm also I'm also very interested in the disaster resilience in the Pacific. Uh, also coming from New Zealand, there's a few questions there. But really, what I wanted to um, find out a bit more about is historically Australia has always done very well economically out of wars because we supply a lot of stuff that gets blown up or used in wars. How is that um, feeding into the current levels of conflict? Um, in that we're a long way away. Um, but we can actually do very well out of any conflict. Lois, that's a really good question. There's two ways Australia's done very well out of this war, less so by uh, sending things that, that blow things up, to use your fantastic expression there. Um, one is gas. Australia's benefited enormously from the disruption to the gas market that began as Europe tried to wean itself off after off, off Russian gas in the immediate aftermath of the invasion in Ukraine. The second, which I'll be having a report coming on my Substack soon, so you can look out for this, is oil. As I mentioned before, India is buying a lot of this oil from Russia and processing it, and then reselling it as Indian oil, so it's no longer Russian product. That means it's there for countries to buy, even countries like Australia, like the United Kingdom, like the United States, who have sanctioned Russia and said that oil is not okay to buy. Those countries are now buying in huge quantities that oil that India is refining and reselling as Indian oil. So that's just two small ways that the Australian economy is actually benefiting from uh, the war in Ukraine. And that's actually been one of the reasons, particularly on gas prices, which the Australian budget came in surplus last year, astonishing everybody, and I think the Labor Party as well. Um, that's actually one of the arguments that many critics of Australia's 
perceived lacklustre support for Ukraine says, well, you guys have actually economically benefited from this war. It's probably incumbent upon you to give a little bit more back to Ukraine as it's fighting for a global order and a global trading environment that actually secures your own economic prosperity. The other thing I would say, going back to your question about things that blow things up, don't underestimate the huge advertising uh, PR wonder that Ukraine has done for Australia on the Bushmaster. The Bushmaster is an, uh, a vehicle that was used in Afghanistan. It's very, very good against things like IUDs and uh, it is IED, sorry, and um, it is something that is manufactured in Australia and Victoria. Now, Ukraine has been begging for these uh, since day one of the war, and we sent them a fair few. And Ukraine, every time Zelensky talks about a Bushmaster, uh, there's this saying that's going around that he's essentially propping up Talus, the defence company which, which produces these in Victoria, and the Victorian market for decades to come because he is telling the entire world how great this piece of military kit is. So we're going to have a long-term benefit just in our defence procurement and defence export industry as well. Well, um, that, that's quite something. What I'm going to do before wrapping up is um, I want to share um, the Tika's um, website. Um, there it is, um, what she's reading. Um, there's the interview on the left-hand side that I mentioned with the, the Czech minister. And there's another story I'd like to have covered, but I think we've run out of time. And that was um, <laughs> a little bit of a scandal about um, Australia's spy master um, exposing a, an Australian MP who was accused of... Um, what was he accused of, Latiki? You might as well mention it briefly. What was he accused of, the MP? Well, basically selling out Australia um, to a foreign country which wasn't named, but we assume was China. And this MP wanted to lead uh, fellow colleagues and academics and co to a delegation on China where they were subsequently met by a bunch of Chinese spies. Nice stuff. <laughs> yeah, lovely stuff. Well, listen, what I really like about your reporting is the breadth of it. You really managed to carry, um, cover a huge amount um, globally and that's um, always, always very, very well informed. Thank you very much indeed for your time here. Um, it, it's uh, even though you're way across the world, you've devoted time to <laughs> us. I'm very grateful. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for having me and thanks for all the great questions.